uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the scope for improvement in film literature in India. Uh, it's a very basic presentation, just a few bullet points and things. Uh, by film literature, I mean pretty much everything from short form reviews that you find in publications, in main mainstream publications, to longer essays, to full-fledged books about cinema. As you know, we are a movie mad country. Uh, Dr. Jaira mentioned Bollywood love, if I can just borrow that phrase for a second. Uh, uh, we, but not just in terms of Indian cinema, but in terms of a growing interest in foreign language films, world cinema, and so on. Uh, the internet in recent years has opened so many avenues for good writers. Blogs and websites make it possible for uh, writers to write enthusiastically and with insight about films that they love. There's been a revival of interest in older films as well. And so the scenario isn't a completely bleak one by any means, but it can get better. There's need for film writing that's more intelligent, but at the same time accessible not over academic, but not dumbed down either. And let me just start at the very basic level with film reviews. Now, one of my pet peeves as a reader, writer, as a movie buff is that the spaces available for reviews in mainstream publications are very small. What happens is that given just 300 or 400 words to work with, even the most skilled writers end up falling into bad habits. They, all they can really do is give a plot summary of a film, make a few token observations, and then give marks to different elements in the film and stick a star rating on top, which becomes the focal point for engagement for the reader as well. Everybody talks about the star rating. This creates a writing and reading culture based on evaluation rather than thoughtful discussion based on the idea that a perspective different from your own cannot be an honest or well-considered perspective. And the results are often very amusing. If you check newspaper websites under reviews, or even the personal blogs of film reviewers, you'll find a variety of very colorful comments. Here's a very short sample of some of them, typical comments. Please, Mr. Reviewer, spare us the big words. Your job is to tell us the plot of the film, whether we should see it. This guy is a pseudo-intellectual who analyzes too much. He takes himself too seriously. I get that a lot. So, 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 so don't mind if I smile a little bit once in a while, just to show that I'm not a, I don't take myself too seriously. And uh, how can you give this film only three stars? Please be objective. This is at least a four and a half star movie. Now, it's also worth noting that when be objective is used in this context, it's really just another way of saying agree with me. That's that's what it means. And and what happens is. From this, you get a very specific picture of the review reader as someone who likes to be led to the ticket counter if a film is good, led away if the film is bad. And if there's disagreement, then watch out, because this uh, little lamb is capable of getting very venomous. And one of the typical responses when a reviewer is deemed to be wrong is this one. It's obvious that this guy has been bought off, either by the producer of the film or by the rival camp. Now, let me clarify, I'm not for a second trying to suggest that all reviewers are angels or incorruptible or anything of that sort. But this sort of reaction, more often than not, is a lazy rationalization because you can't deal with the fact that somebody else thinks completely differently about a movie that you loved or a movie that you hated. Uh, again, this gets amusing. and I've never been a regular film reviewer for a major publication, but I've been on the receiving end of this too. A few years ago, I remember I'd written something negative about a Shah Rukh Khan film. And promptly, I get these blog comments as well as a couple of emails saying pretty much the same thing. So how much did Amir Khan pay you to do this review? <laughs> and it was a surreal moment because there I was staring into my computer screen and drifting off into this daydream where I'm, where I'm in this 1970s Hindi film about smugglers with Amir Khan's secretary's henchman calling me up and asking me to meet him on a deserted beach and then handing over a briefcase full of gold biscuits or something like that. Shah Rukh Wale film ko ek star se nahi dene ka. It was uh, funny, uh, but once this very pleasant daydream was over, I had to get back to doing what I do, which is writing for very little money. Now, we are not as important or as influential as a lot of people seem to think. But this leads us to the, the, the point that any reviewer, even the most intelligent reviewer, is essentially an individual who will have 
a specific perspective on a film that might be completely different from yours because it it will depend on things ranging from his life experiences, his ideologies, his feelings about different subjects, the mood that he was in on the day that he went to see the film, his aesthetic sense, which again could be very different. So holding someone else's taste as a benchmark for your own is never going to really work in the long run. This leads us to the question, what is the whole point of a review then? If the principal purpose of a review is not to instruct the reader, watch this, don't watch this, what is the whole point? Why, why do we even carry them in papers? And there are many answers to this. Uh, one is that a really good review, and preferably a long form piece of writing, will be a solid piece of writing on its own terms. It should be something that you can read and enjoy for what it is, for the craft that's gone into it, for the window that it opens into a new way of watching a film or talking about a film. Uh, it's a bit of a pity that many people think that reviews can't be good literature because really you read some of the great film critics, or for that matter literary critics in the world, they are people who engage with a film, they give, you, they give you a first-hand perspective of how another kind of mind might respond to a particular work. This is something that Pauline Kyle, the great American film critic, wrote in response to letter writers who would tell her, if you want to be a critic, why don't you try making a film first? As if you know the critic has to be in a separate box and the artist has to be in a separate box. Uh, it, it's a much longer and very good piece, so you should try and find it on the net. But the ideal reviewer, as I said, should be a perceptive writer, a good writer. Background knowledge is obviously very important. If you're reviewing a film by a particular director, it helps if you, you're familiar with his previous work, so you can uh, talk about themes, visual connections, and so on. That's very important. Now, in practice, this, this doesn't happen often enough because uh, the urgencies of journalism are such that people are working on multiple beats at the same time, not really honing their talents in one field, deadlines are very strict, but it's still something that we should aspire towards and we can aspire towards. Genre tolerance is another thing, this is very important for a really good reviewer. What this means is that you should be able to look at a film as an individual work, rather than coming to it with a preconception that this is this type of film, and therefore this is what I think about this type of film. Uh, because th that really is a barrier to understanding and to really seeing a movie. Say a male critic doesn't like mushy romantic films. Uh, this can close his mind to a really good, really well-written, well-performed movie that falls roughly in the rom-com genre. And that would be a pity again. Someone, as I mentioned, someone who opens doors to new ways of watching and thinking. You should be able to read a good review and even if you completely disagree with uh, the reviewer's perspective of a film, you should say, wow, you know, I, I disagree with him, but I completely see where he's coming from and I understand what he means. The importance of analysis, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes uh, by D.H. Lawrence, never trust the artist, trust the tale. Because a lot of reviewers tend to get accused of over-analyzing or reading too much into a film. Now again, I'm not making a blanket defense for anyone, there are many over-imaginative reviewers who seem to be writing their own film scripts instead of just reviewing the existing work. But in principle, what Lawrence's quote means is that when you're analyzing a work of art, you're under no obligation to pay special heed to what the artist himself has to say about it. Now say, if I'm sitting with a film director, talking with him, it, this can be a very good journalistic project, it can be an interview, but I have to keep in mind that this, this guy has his own biases and prejudices. Perhaps he's too close to his own film to really see the whole thing clearly. And even if he's being honest with me, the creative process is a very mysterious thing. All sorts of subconscious things happen all the time. And it's up to me to look at the film and see what the film is telling me and, and then honestly try to articulate it. In this context, uh, uh, I want to share something from this book that I've written about Janibi Toyaro, a film that I hope some of you have seen, most of you would be aware of it. There's an early scene in the film, a very visually striking scene where four of the bad guys go to the top of a building together in a construction crane and along the way they are offering and accepting bribes, laughing evilly, doing all the things that movies, movie villains are supposed to do. And when they reach the top, you see them only in silhouette. You don't see their expressions clearly. They're walking around clinking their whiskey glasses and you see them only in silhouette. Now this scene is, is wonderfully apt for the moment because it's like a visual representation of the Kale Karname, the dark deeds of these guys. 
But when I met Kundan Shah, the writer director of the film, and spoke to him, he laughed and shrugged his shoulders and said, "Aha, you know, you're you're being a critic again. Uh, it wasn't planned like that at all." What he said was that when they reached the top of the building for the shoot, it was evening. The natural light had faded a little sooner than expected. This was a a, a low budget shot. They hadn't brought enough. Uh, artificial lights with them and so someone said let's just take this shot and see what it looks like see if it works out now my point is fair enough that's the back story but the critic someone who's analyzing this film really looking at what this film is doing visually and otherwise should be able to look at the scene and talk about it in the context that many other key scenes in jane biro yaro are also shot in the dark it's a movie where some of the most important events in the film happen in an almost subterranean darkness which uh, is thematically apt as well the fact is even if this is a case of making virtue out of necessity someone the director or the cinematographer had a gut instinct that this could work that you know we could get we could be onto something here so it's completely valid to look at the scene on its own terms and to analyze it accordingly since i'm talking about the janabi to yaro book a word about film books in india uh, again too many movie related books tend to fall into one of two extremes they are either heavily academic with lots of jargon that will drive away the average reader or so flippant and facile that they read like a movie magazine that you can just open at any page read a bit move to 20 pages ahead and so on uh, two years ago when ar rahman was nominated for the oscar for slum dog millionaire i remember there were a couple of major publishers who were trying to get biographies of rahman commissioned within just one month so these books could be ready in time for the oscars in case he won which of course he, he did now what a disservice that would have been to one of our great musicians you know, the result would have been a shoddily thrown together barely edited book with you know, factual inaccuracies this sort of thing does happen when i started writing my janabi to yaro book i was very conscious about this and one thing i promised myself was that i would write it as a narrative non fiction that is as a book that a reader would be able to start reading from page 1 and then read all the way through the same way that he would read a good novel now it's not for me to say whether i have succeeded or not but that was the intention right from the start i know some of you might be wondering how it's possible to write a whole book about a single film uh, it's such a waste of trees on one level it uh, seems like it it's uh, I, i don't want to run out of talking points beyond the point i would say with a film like janabi to yaro i don't know how many of you have seen it but this is basically a comedy film that uses various modes of comedy including satire or slapstick comedy to comment on social evils like corruption inequality and so on that itself makes it a very unique dark comedy in the context of hindi in the hindi cinema but also it was made by a number of very enthusiastic young people from the the cream of indian theater and indian parallel cinema who were very political in their views they were left leaning radicals who thought that cinema could be used to change the world so what that means is that one way of writing about a film like this is to examine it in the context of the socio political structure of india in the 1970s that would be one way for example that one writer might choose i did something slightly different i drew on my experience as a journalist and a critic to analyze the making of the film right including the journey of kundan shah from someone who was in a business family into the creative field writing this bizarre script that somehow got made and including the many twists and turns along the way the way the story initially seemed to be about something else but then gradually changed and what it might have been these are all talking points as well and they tell us very important things about how a work of art comes into existence and how it strikes a chord with a particular audience in a particular place and time i was a kid when i watched janavi do yaro in the early 80s on doordarshan and on the, the, the single channel era black and white tvs i'm sure many others of my generation have had that experience it was a cultural milestone for many of us why did it have that have that effect on us this is a talking point as well in the process of writing this book i learned lots of things about about movie writing uh, for one thing this film is much more of a concept film than an execution film in the sense that a lot of critics have this uh, motto which is the how is more important than the what 
what that basically means is that how how a story is told is more important than what the base the story is what the story is about but jane bhi to yaar ho is a different sort of film here the story is much more important the con the basic concept of using comedy for the for these dark purposes is more important and so while writing about it i found myself focusing on other things i couldn't talk about the the technical polish of the film or the cinematic language because there's very little of that it's not a very uh, well made film technically speaking but the concept is important and that's one major thing for any film writer you you a lifetime is not enough to keep learning there are thousands and thousands of great movies that achieve their ends in completely different ways and even if you're writing about films for 60 or 70 years at the end of your life you'll find that there's still more that you have to learn keep keep that in mind be humble etc i wanted to say a word since i've been talking now about the professional film writer somebody who writes about movies for a livelihood i want to talk about uh, this anthology of film essays that i edited called the popcorn essays the idea here was to get together well known writers novelists and so on who don't write professionally about cinema and to get them to write pieces about a way in which cinema intersected their lives or some movie related experience that meant a lot to them and the results have been very revealing because they've shown the many ways there are of responding to a film including contrasting ways just to give you an example there are two pieces here one is by amitabh kumar the well known academic and uh, novelist he's written a piece about ram gopal verma's film satya and he writes at one point that he thinks of himself as a citizen of the world created by bollywood now he relates an anecdote where he had just broken up with an american girlfriend and he was in very low spirits he was listening to a hindi film song tu hi re and in a drunken emotional moment he promised himself that he would never marry a woman who didn't understand the lyrics of this song now 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 there you have a, a one way of you know responding of your of someone's life intersecting with a film at the other end of the spectrum anjum hassan the novelist and poet has been married for many years to a scandinavian writer someone from a completely different culture and country and when she went to finland for the first time to meet his family she found herself trying to understand that culture through the prism of the movies that she had watched that were set in finland so you have two completely different experiences there what one you know amitabha being more you know looking at the indian girl who can understand the lyrics of this hindi song and on the other hand and anjum with a completely different perspective and now i'll ask you to picture a middle aged writer a mathematics professor at a brooklyn book festival he does a very solemn reading he reads from one of his novels and after the reading he goes backstage puts on a dhagra choli comes back onto the stage and then dances for 5 minutes to a helen song now this is exactly what manil suri the novelist did in brooklyn 2 years ago it's not a very pretty picture but uh, if you want to see the full video you can see it on youtube it's, uh, do a search for this he had been asked to do something that he had never done before in public and he decided to draw on his childhood experiences of watching helen movies and to use this as a pretext to act out what had been a private uh, i'd like to end on a so more somber note uh, we unfortunately have a very poor culture of film preservation in india some of you might be aware that it was in the news recently that the first indian sound film alamara no longer exists it exists only in stills because the negative has been irretrievably damaged this is a major cultural loss now that of course is an 80 year old film we are talking about but even movies made 25 30 years ago are in dire straits directors like govind nilani and ketan mehta don't have good complete prints of their own movies and 2 years ago i met nasiruddin shah the actor for an interview and he told me that he had a copy a battered video cassette of one of his oldest films albert pinto ko gussa kyun aata hai and he mentioned that he would never lend that to anyone because he was sure that it, if it went out of his sight he would never see a copy of that movie again in his life that's how bad things are and this in a sense makes the need for film literature even more vital and more relevant because writing is after all a means of preserving our cultural heritage holding on to the past capturing something that has been lost in other forms and that's the thought that i'd like to leave you with when i as i end this talk thank you very much